hear that. Okay, is this any better? Uh, ben, can, can you, you hear me? It's still a little faint, but we'll see if we can get it adjusted from there. You might tell Testing us, one, uh, two, three, four. There we go. Is this any better? Is that any better? Uh, now it's a little on the loud side, but <laughs> but I think we're getting there. So I'm not uh, sorry for the trouble. Okay. Uh, I think some of our uh, the other folks connected into the Zoom are hearing okay. So it may just oh. be amplifying it there or something like that. But <clears throat> yeah, it could be something there. So we will do our best to continue on. So. You just right. tell me, Ben. Well, I'll try. I'll I'll try to adjust as I as I need to. Just let me know. Okay, we'll do. Uh, and as I told you, Stephen, and as folks here know too, we've been having these conversations. We adopted a new mission statement as a church last year, joining God's work of new creation, and as well as three ways we're hoping to express that mission in the coming year, uh, in this year, uh, by embracing all God's people relying on the Holy Spirit, and joining Christ's global church in the ministry of reconciliation. And so this summer, we've taken an opportunity to just have conversations with different folks who are on mission in their own contexts about the mission of God and about different contexts where they're serving and helping us think about how to live into our mission here. One of the things we haven't brought into the conversation quite as much uh, is scripture. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you tonight is about a particular scripture to kind of help us think about mission. Um, and, and honestly, um, with all the in introduction I gave you, there's so many different things we could talk about out of your expertise. But as you and I caught up this year, one of the areas I'm most interested in is you're a Bible class teacher at your church. And the scripture that you've really been leading your church through is the book of Revelation, which may be a kind of a surprising pick. Uh, but that's what I'm wanting for us to talk about tonight is why that book and what does that have to do with Christian mission and how might that be a resource for us here as we're thinking about our mission. Um, so uh, as a place to start, uh, Revelation's, uh, Revelation's a strange book in the Bible, and it's one of those, I remember when I was in junior high, it looked like a junior high boys Bible study, and we all thought we wanted to study Revelation because it sounds like it's going to be really cool because there's dragons and, you know, it seems like there's fighting and things like that. But when we got into it, it was really just sort of strange and unlike other things that we were used to. And so I find myself as one of those people who tend to avoid Revelation rather than running towards it. Uh, but how would you introduce uh, the book of Revelation to somebody like me who may be somebody who wants to keep it at an arm's length? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's funny. I'm reminded, Ben, when you say that of... Oh, uh, I think we're having some oh. sound issues again. No? Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, is, uh, is this any better? Are folks online <clears throat> hearing? Yep. Carrie says she can hear fine. I've got two different inputs. Um, all good online. Uh, we're hearing from Natalie. So we're still having trouble hearing you in this room, Stephen. I apologize for that. Okay. Is this oh. any better? I'll just keep talking and maybe. Yes, we're, we're hearing you clearly you now. So I hope we've got you. Okay. Good. Well, hello. Oh. <laughs> ben, you, you stop me if somehow the audio goes out again, okay? I think you phased out again on us. Oh, man. Carrie, still good on your end? I, I think, okay. yeah, I can start to hear you now. It's a little crackly, which makes me think we may have a cord. Uh, but keep talking, see if we can hear you now. Okay, I'll, I'll just jump right in. And Ben, you wave at me. I, I'm fine being interrupted. So if All right. nothing's coming through, I won't, I won't keep talking. So we good? Uh, we can hear you, yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. So when you said that, Ben, I was reminded of a little throwaway line that Fred Craddock, uh, sort of a legendary uh, homiletics or preaching pro uh, professor and scholar at uh, the annual lectures on preaching at ACU said one time he was doing uh, some lectures on the book of Hebrews and preaching. <clears throat> he was talking about the different kinds of writings in the New Testament. Uh, you got the Gospels and 
said, we really like it. And we're in the bright, we're in the bright light of the gospels. It's familiar. It's narrative stories about Jesus. And then we're into acts and still have some of that. And then into the epistles and then you get to Hebrews and things are looking a little darker, a little more cloudy. And then you get all the way to first and second Peter. And, and then eventually down at the very end of the road is that terrible, horrific looking house that is revelation. And we turn around and we run back into the safe light. So I think that's something of what you're describing. It is this strange, ominous sort of appears kind of dark writing that seems odd to us. So we're curious about it, but we don't know exactly what to do with it. And so we'd rather hang out in the gospels for a while. I think revelations like that, but I, I, I believe um, as I've come to understand the kind of writing it is, it's social, the, the social and historical context um, to which it is written, reflecting on our own times, that there's no more writing in the New Testament more relevant for 21st century New Testament Christian Christianity in North America in particular than the book of Revelation. I think it's extraordinarily relevant and worth fighting through some of the awkwardness that we feel in engaging that text. Um, and part of the reason for this uh, is because we don't just um, read text as these flat objects that um, we're distanced from. We always read from somewhere. And um, it's one of the things I appreciate about uh, Ben's preaching. He's one of my favorite preachers, not preaching students, my favorite preachers. Um, is because he understands that we read these texts from somewhere and to somewhere, that there's this active live interaction with these texts that become really rich ground for us discerning what God might speak to us in the moment. And I think Revelation is like that. It's we read from our own context in 21st century North America in the year 2021 um, as Christian people. And the text helps us to understand the moment that we're in. And not only that, but the moment that we're in becomes sort of a lens through which we um, inescapably are engaging with these texts. There's this interplay that's going on between the two. And I think it's really, really important uh, for uh, some, re uh, some, some very specific reasons. So uh, yeah. I think it's really important. I think it's a really important text to spend some time with. So I brought it to my Bible class and they were like, oh, uh, what to do with this? And we spent, uh, I don't know, maybe we've spent three or four months together uh, just sort of dwelling in uh, the writing uh, at the end of our New Testament that is uh, Revelation. I apologize again, Stephen. We're still having you phase in and out, but I heard you talking about, brought this to your Bible class there at the Bernie Church of Christ. I know you're teaching and had some engagement around some of those same questions that you're talking about, that this is a text that in some ways feels a bit foreign, obscure, but has some things to say to our contemporary context that may be important uh, for us to hear. So I saw you take off your headphones. You want to try the I'm hoping that maybe makes a difference, but I don't know if it will or not. Well, we can hear you clearly for the moment. So, uh, okay, we'll quick, let's go. Yeah, quick, <laughs> let's get it in. Um, so, uh, help us. Uh, maybe we haven't read Revelation in a little while, or maybe never. Um, give us uh, what's kind of the three to five minute overview of what are we going to find in that book? Yep. So, uh, as you know, after sort of an opening statement, the revelation of Jesus Christ to those, so on and so forth, uh, it begins with these letters, seven of them, letters to uh, the ecclesia, to the churches in uh, the Roman province of Asia Minor. And um, I think it's important to note that uh, these letters are written uh, by John from the island of Patmos, where he's exiled, to churches in a particular region. These are um, these are churches that are located in a province of the Roman Empire. And those, those dynamics matter. We can kind of, if it's familiar to us, we can kind of skip past that. But these are sort of colonies, provinces of the Roman Empire. And to these Christian communities that as Christianity has begun to spread out, um, have, have taken hold in these areas. I think it's important to note that he calls them churches and that that word early on that Christians were not uh, Christian communities were not referred to as churches. They were referred to as the, sort of the followers of Jesus or the followers of the way. And that word ecclesia came to be the way that Christian communities 
began to refer to themselves as ecclesia. Ecclesia is not a new word that Christians made up. Uh, that word was uh, common in the Greco-Roman world, and at all, all Roman cities or townships or provinces had ecclesia. It means literally the Greek word before Christianity came around at all referred to a citizen's assembly. They were local communities uh, engaged uh, in civic planning, in sort of civic rituals, the discussion of issues that are common to the public citizenry. Think of it like a town hall, these assemblies, ecclesia as assembly. Um, so are you catching any of that? I'm hoping. Yes, we got you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, Philip. So, so first of all, you got it's all good. You got letters, seven of them written to these different locations that are referred to as ecclesia. And Christians chose this word to refer to themselves as ecclesia in order to contrast the kind of assembly um, that they constituted. They were an alternative assembly of the new order that they believe was inaugurated by the death and resurrection in the, the story of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus infused with the life of the spirit and that they were uh, at the vanguard of this new age that was breaking in as a result of that. They believed that to be true. And so they chose a word that already existed to refer to citizens assemblies, to set themselves up as an alternative order, a new way of being and living in, in human community that reflected the desire, the vision, the intent of God for the world as it was playing out through the life and uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. So I think you've got the seven letters and then you have a series of unfolding and interlocking visions. So you may be familiar with some of these uh, visions. You've got uh, a scroll with seven seals and then each of the seven seals represent different things. And you may be, if you're uh, familiar a little bit with Revelation, this is where you get the riders on the white horse and the red horse and the pale horse and the, all of that. You get all of those are in the, the seven seals. And, and I think what I would say here just is because you said three to five minutes, which is really really difficult Ben. possible but it's okay uh, you're doing good but 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 the idea in that in the, this opening vision sequence is that the the desire of god for the world um is sort of written on the written on the scroll mm -hmm. the resolution of the fact that um god is sovereign and reigns and is the source of all life and creation and yet the world seems so much so broken and in travail and, and Christians live between this claim that uh, the Lord our God reigns. He was and is and is to come and so on and so forth. And yet, if he reigns, then why is the world in travail? Why is it broken? Why do we experience that? Mm. And, and so that the dilemma to that question is sealed up, on, is written on the scroll. The answer to that dilemma is written on the scroll in the vision. But the scroll is sealed up by these things represented by the seals. In other words, we don't know, we can't open it. And so John weeps and weeps because there's no one to open the seal and I'll move on. So that's the first of, this, of, the, of the visions is the throne room vision with the scroll and the seals, the seven seals. And interestingly, as that vision unfolds and each of the seven seals is, is kind of uh, revealed, the seventh one opens up to another vision. Um, another series of seven. So you, you have seven seals that then give way to these seven trumpets. And these seven trumpets um, announce something. They are warnings, um, seven of them. And each of them is told. And so that the seven warning uh, judgments is the second vision that warning trumpets unfolds. And then when you get to the seventh trumpet, it announces finally this declaration. Okay, the kingdom of our Lord has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And he will reign on the earth forever and ever. This big announcement in the seventh one. And then that seventh announcement then gives way to an, a, a, a vision with another series of seven. And these are seven bowls. And the bowls are enacting uh, the warning announcements that the trumpets have declared. And so then these bowls are kind of poured out, these judgments. So it, think of it as a series of, seven, of, of three visions with seven interlocking components that open up into each other. Like if you, if you know what a Russian babushka doll is, where you open it and you take another one out and inside there's another one and inside there's another one. Revelation unfolds like that. And there's a reason for that. All of that leads up 
to uh, what I think is the key and critical climactic moment in Revelation, which is found in Revelation 18 and 19, mm. where finally in Revelation 18, there is um, uh, the announcement that uh, um, Babylon, which is the empire, and he has before him this, this view of of Rome as an empire um, and its ways, he says, uh, Babylon is fallen. It's a declaration, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And um, what I want you to know is that at the time when John declares this to these Christian communities, Rome is nowhere near fallen. Rome is in its, it's thriving, it's flourishing, it's prosperous, it's powerful. It's expanding. So he's, he's making a claim. Look, if you could see beyond the veil, and he writes this vision up in the sky, apocalyptically, you would see that empire, Rome, is fallen. And then there are three funeral dirges because it's fallen and it's no more. Um, and those three funeral dir dirges are really important. And then in chapter 19, uh, on the heels of that announcement that Rome has fallen, he says, okay, so you Christians in these early uh, Christian communities in Asia Minor, rejoice. Um, hallelujah. This is good news. Um, because this way that is opposed or contrast to the way uh, the desire of God for, for life in in human community and the flourishing of all things in the new creation and the new order, that's coming to pass. And so this is told in, in vivid terms, apocalyptic. It's not just a prediction of the future, but a mirror to the present. And I think that's what's going on. I'm sorry to take so long with that in, in the overall arc of what's taking place. It's meant to be read, Ben, on the whole, not in parts. You need to kind of get the yeah. sense of the whole beautiful panorama of what's taking place there and what it's trying to do. So is that helpful in kind of a little bit longer than three to five minute overview of the content. That's, so, yeah, so. that's what I, I asked three to five knowing that's not going to work. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, to help us get a sense of it. it uh, I'm struck that uh, we, we kind of left off the final panel, though, is maybe some of the most famous images in Revelation that there's this fall of Babylon of the empire, but then there's this coming of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly yeah. Jerusalem. Uh, do you want to say a little bit about that? Sure, and it's pictured in ways that are strikingly similar, similar to the descriptions as, as the biblical witness tries to give us a glimpse into um, the fullness of God's good creation in the very beginning, right? So there's a river that runs through and a tree of life, and uh, um, the, the city is turned into a garden that flourishes. Think of this sort of, um, uh, this is a little bit anachronistic, uh, but think of the greening of the city. And it, it is about the restoration of the good creation, the new creation, and the flourishing of all things, the created order, meaning the world that we live in, air that we breathe, and all of that, the created order, uh, the created ones in relationship with each other, how we live this, 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 uh, how God desires for us and draws us up into human community, regardless of where we come from or who we are, that he's making us a one and making us whole in human community. And the oneness really of the creation with its creator. Um, uh, it is this um, idea that probably most familiar to us is uh, no more death or crying um, or mourning or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, uh, God is coming and bringing these things to pass where, where death is not just the cessation of our physical bodies, but death in all its forms, in every form uh, that we experience where life is choked out and um, inequality exists, where, where people suffer um, physically or they're alienated or cut off from human community and there's a lack death in all its forms is passing away and this new thing is coming it really is a beautiful beautiful picture in the end yeah thanks for that now you mentioned this word a few times uh apocalyptic mm -hmm. um we've talked about a bit we've been in the gospel of mark here lately as a church and so i've talked a bit about apocalyptic and especially how that's one of those words that's snuck into the english language and means something different 
than what it did uh, initially. Uh, it comes from a Greek word that means something different than that. We tend to think about apocalyptic having to do with the destruction of the world and things falling apart. Um, but in its essence, uh, it, it has to do with unveiling or revealing. And you've used that image before, of tearing back the veil. Um, what, do you, what kinds of things does Revelation reveal as an apocalypse? And you, you've hinted yeah. at this a bit, but could you say a little more about that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's really, really important. Um, seeing the Wizard of Oz, you know, in the end, yeah. they make their way to the Emerald City. And they're all standing there before the Great Oz. And they pull back the curtain, and the great Oz is exposed for what he is. A little guy pulling levers. In some sense, that's the revealing that's taking place here, is that the empire and the way it orders life, the way it exerts its power um, and hegemony and all of that um, is false. It's a false form of power. It's not a real form of power in that um, it's pulling back the veil on that. Let me, let me say a bit more here. We come back to those seven letters. So right after the, the announcement in chapter one that begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ, these, these seven letters are, are uh, written. And we tend to think, to your point about apocalyptic being this cataclysmic thing where, man, the church is about to, I mean, the world's about to implode and the church is suffering and all of that. We tend to think of it as persecution literature. But if you've walked through these seven letters carefully and you pay attention to the warning or the admonition to each of these seven churches, um, is it that he's saying to the church in uh, churches in Asia Minor that you're suffering, hang in there, you're suffering, you're being persecuted? Or is he saying to them, hey, you guys um, wake up, you've fallen asleep, or you've just become lukewarm? Or you've really compromised uh, this. I would, if you go back and look at it, there's only one of the seven letters that I would say warns them about, um, hey, I'm sorry, hang in there, you're suffering, you're, you're experiencing the empire as violence. All the others are, you're, you're living in relationship as Christian communities to the empire, and you've kind of been compromised, you've been co-opted. You've been seduced. The two dominant images in Revelation for the empire are the beast, right, as an image, a type, and the other one, a harlot, a seductress. And, and really, the empire moves in those two ways. It exerts influence and power. It tries to seduce you and co-opt and co you and subtly. And, the, and if it can't do that, well, then it'll exert its power and make you um, uh, line up with its agenda. And the threat here, I think, to the seven churches, the ecclesia, is not that the empire is exerting its power over you. It's that you guys have become too comfortable. You've been co-opted by the empire, by the social political realities in which you exist in your context. You're too at home with Rome. That's a great that, that'll preach, right? That'll You're preach, man. Rome yeah, yeah. With Rome. That could be a sermon. That could be a sermon title. And, and so he's saying, wake up. And, and the reason that he writes this as, apoc uh, as, as the unveiling of, of things, right? Ben, this is what you're alluding to. It's this gradual yeah. unveiling is because when you've been compromised and co-opted, you're so at home uh, in the space that you exist, it's difficult to see anymore. You can't, it, it's like the frog in the water, right? That, that is gradually, you don't feel the change. And so it's hard to see it. So what does he do? He projects this, this reality, this, this wake up call cosmically into the heavens to give them some kind of ex, dis, experience distant referent, right? So that they can see, hey, here's where we're being Oh, I did. I couldn't even see that. But if, if these images are so vivid and they're cosmic, and so they they come back as a mirror to to uh, call them to wake up to um, the ways of the empire, the ways that they've they've uh, compromised that. I'll, I'll mention just one other thing along these lines. If if um, this is this is true, um, uh, this idea that the churches of Asia, seven churches of Asia Minor, 
are not under duress at the time that John writes this, but they have actually been co-opted is supported by historical documents of the time. So you have someone like an ancient orator from Asia Minor named uh, Alias Aristides, who goes to the empire and he's reporting back on the state of affairs back in Asia Minor, where these seven churches exist about this same time period. And his reports are about how good things are and how they're flourishing and prospering and, and everything is good. And, um, and the, the Christians in Asia Minor are the benefit factors of that, they've got a lot of vested interest in getting along with Rome, in maintaining the status quo, uh, because things are so uh, configured so well. And the trade-off there is, yep, they've had to sell out the way of Jesus and the way of power as self-giving love and the willingness to sacrifice and die has been co-opted by uh, these uh, by the way of the empire. So I said way too much there, but I think that's the point, Ben, is that um, it's a mirror into, into uh, this revealing of something that's hard for us to see because we've become much too enmeshed and co-opted by the realities in which we exist. And that's one of the reasons, you may wanna probe this a little bit, or if you don't, just point me in another direction that I say that, hey, this book may be among, I think it is the most relevant for 21st century North American Christians because of the social location of, of um, churches and Christianity in North America to the dominant ethos uh, that surrounds us. Is that helpful at all or just confusing? I, no, I hope it's helpful, um, tracking <laughs> with you. And, um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that, although I'm wanting to leave some time to invite others into the conversation as well. So uh, let's do that at this time to just invite any folks with questions, responses. If you can, uh, say your name when you're talking into the microphone, that'll help folks online know who you are. I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, my name is Chelsea Flo. I'm a, um, about to be an MDiv student at ACU. So um, I guess I'm wondering, we have at the beginning of Revelation, we have the letters to the seven churches, which are more about you know advice and what they should be doing differently. Um, but then as the book progresses, we get less and less, I guess, practical, where do we go from here stuff from the letter. Um, so what would you say, especially as we're thinking about this now, what would you say the rest of Revelation would call us as Americans to do? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, I think that uh, the penultimate uh, appeal in Revelation, in the context, the social and historical context in which it's written and in our own, is um, come out. This is Revelation 18. Come out of her. Come out of empire. You are not of that. You are an alternative community. You represent uh, this idea of the new humanity. God has uh, redeemed and infused you and is placed within the life of the church, the capacity empowered by and infused by the life of the spirit to represent something else. And, and um, so the warning is, have you let yourself become too um, enmeshed, as I say, uh, to this? So, and it does so by this series of unfolding visions in which it's, it's beginning to help us to see and reflect upon that. So really it is a check to say, how much is our allegiance tied to um, the social, uh, political realities around us? Where does our hope really reside? Or is it, to the, is it to the kingdoms of this world? Or is it to this notion of the inbreaking of, of, of the kingdom of God? And I think that's clear in what flows out from those letters and the series of visions up to that climactic point in which he's trying to, uh, in an artful, in an artistic and artful and creative way, uh, enable those early Christian communities, enable us to be self-reflective and confessional about the ways that we've uh, compromised our allegiance to the kingdom of God over against the kingdoms of this world. Does that help, Chelsea? Yes, she's nodding her head, so. Yeah. 
We got another question here. Hi, this is Charles Holton. Um, something that's always given me a lot of difficulty with Revelation is the gleeful uh, destruction of the enemies of the church uh, and rejoicing over their slaughter in many different ways being portrayed there. Yep. How, how can that fit with a Christian uh, love thy enemies uh, notion? Yeah, I would say um, uh, it is what John is drawing upon uh, Ben's right. Apocalyptic is a Greek word that means something in particular, revealing. Um, but it's also uh, denotes a literary form and a literary device that uh, is rooted um, in antiquity, um, in, um, is adopted by the Jewish prophets, although it also appears in other places. And so it is a literary uh, uh, device or art form to convey something. So for example, and I struck, I just want to say, Charles, that I resonate with your question because I, I too struggle with that. And, and as a companion to that, I also struggle with the image of um, the harlot and its implications as well, the seductress, and whether that's a fair image or not. But, but I, I think, for example, that, that the, he's trying to draw upon a literary device and form that would be more familiar, perhaps, than, than uh, to the original audience, than to us, and he's pulling that forward. Now, when, when he talks about the rider on the horse, for example, coming, and he has a sword, and he slays his enemies and all of that, notice, mm -hmm. notice the way that he turns that imagery, that the sword... Um, isn't one that he wields with his fist with power, but the sword, he says, comes from his mouth. In other words, and, and some scholars have called this the transvaluation of, of these violent images. He's saying that um, maybe our sword is not violence in the form that the empire wields it, but is on the testimony of our words. And so that our words have power to resist in a form of their own and that the word of the testimony about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, this notion of the power of self-giving love is itself um, able, potent to strike down this other way of power exercised as violence. So I would wanna press through uh, sort of an initial reading of that to say that these images, though there's certainly appear problematic that maybe they're inviting us to consider that they they might have some some deeper nuanced use that's being turned in light of the story of Jesus if that makes sense great question though uh, and in some sense I'm not trying to explain away those images but inviting us to live within the tension of them a little bit and and say well maybe John is also inviting us to consider that these things that we typically see as images of violence um, actually point to something nonviolent. And that's not uniform, but I think there are some instances where that certainly appears to be the case in terms of the kind of writing we have here. I think we've got another question uh, here. Stephen, this is Paul Watson uh, speaking Hi, Paul. and want to pick up on this uh, some. I have found it helpful you know, talking about the, the artistry and the creativity and the literary characteristics of, of Revelation to uh, liken uh, Revelation to holy science fiction. And I don't know if that's if pushing the envelope a little, but you know, uh, it, it has been so popular to us uh, as, a, as a people from Planet of the Apes and Star Wars and, you know, all the way down to, to the present, you know, we get that stuff and we understand that in the best of it, there are some messages woven into all of the, the explosions and, and the fights and, and all of that. Would that be helpful in, in your opinion to, to help people identify with the, the literary I nature think, of it? Yeah, I, actually, I think it is, Paul. I think it's quite helpful. I think that uh, contemporary science fiction is, is the closest thing that we, we have, and it functions 
in a similar way. So whether or not all of the images are the same, there are obviously different images deployed, but the idea of sort of co a, a cosmic picture intended to evoke an interpretation of what's happening in the world around us, that's, what apo that's how apocalyptic functions and that's how science fiction functions. I think, Ben, maybe it was when uh, you were uh, at ACU, we were working on a little project where we were tracking this, yeah. where we said, hey, if you look at the history of uh, c contemporary film and science fiction film, certainly you could do this with, with uh, um, written science fiction as well, but the film adaptations, many of these forms, whether they're um, sort of nuclear apocalypses or biological ones or uh, um, uh, sort of cataclysmic astro, th those, uh, often are popular and occur in popular culture over against uh, some event that's happening that's disrupted the world as we know it. Like, um, think of an example like 9-11, uh, an experience common to all of us that, that, that we have to stop and rethink things. Often you'll see the occurrence of these adaptations of science fiction as a way to comment on what's happening in the world or without doing it directly. The, it, it does so, right, Paul? It does so indirectly by, by making it look differently or, or a little bit distant from us, but it very much has everything to do with how we interpret this. Think of this being a, a manner of, of writing and listening, because they likely listen to this read, in which the imagination was provoked to interpret again in the revealing, who are we as the people of God? And what time is it? What's going on? And what do we need to hear from this? So I think that's a very apt uh, uh, illustration or connection to the literary form. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. And we're needing to wrap up our time, Stephen. This is making me miss having you as a professor. I've really enjoyed uh, <laughs> hearing you share with us tonight. And if folks are interested in connecting with you, are there places they can do that? Uh, online or ways to get in touch? Absolutely. Love to hear from folks, Ben. Uh, feel free. Uh, I'm happy to pass along uh, my email address. Um, certainly uh, willing to set an appointment for a chat by phone or, or even one of these Zoom conferences, whatever works for you. But um, I, a little bit of advance notice allows me to be uh, responsive. We can schedule those. But um, I'm always eager to engage these conversations. And man, it also makes me miss uh, spending time with you where we often uh, create the space uh, informally to have these kind of conversations um, that are really, really important and essential. So thanks for inviting me to spend a few minutes with you and with the, the good folks at the Cole Mill Road Church. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, one more thing I wanted to ask you, I've been asking each of our guests, our, our mission is joining God's work of new creation. So it's this admission that God's up to something in the world and we don't necessarily have the exclusive take on it. And so I have asked each of our guests if, if there's, a, uh, there's something you might invite us to join, uh, something that you think's happening in the world that we might hop in. And that could be something like pick up Revelation and actually read it, or, uh, or that could be something else that may be on your mind. But is there something you might draw our attention to there as we're thinking about how to join God's work of new creation? Um, yes. Um, I'll tie it to Revelation. And it's, it's not the only place. I think there are multiple places where the kingdom of God is breaking out, right? Yes. So I think the first thing I would say is rather than finding the one thing is cultivating the disposition uh, the curiosity to explore where God might be leading and, and, and then join that. Mm. In particular, I would say, I mentioned Revelation 18 <clears throat> and those three that, that, that announcement, fallen, fallen is, is the empire and the world in its ways has fallen, come out of her. Um, and then the three funeral dirges. The first one is to the kings of the earth. So think of it as people in power who make the rules and everybody kind of structures. The second is to merchants. Hmm. Think of it as business and commerce. And the third is to uh, sea captains and, and ship bearers. And it has to do with commerce. We would think of it as shipping or which, you know, with Amazon, we're shipping everything everywhere. Mm -hmm. So those are the three. Now, 
pay attention to the one in the middle. It has to do with commerce. And when he talks about commerce, he gives a long list of, of things that are bought and sold. It starts with uh, inanimate objects and precious things, and then it goes to, you know, uh, scents and oils and wine and and then it's commodities like flour and wheat and so on and so forth. And at the end of that very long list, at the center of this piece that I would encourage you to pay close attention to, he talks about all these things that are bought and sold. And the last line is the bodies and souls of people. He's talking about how prosperity in the, in the way of the empire, prosperity in a world of of influence and power and comfort is built um, on buying and selling human persons. I would tie that to the vision at the beginning of Revelation and in the end, that the people of God, the new humanity, draws people from every tribe and language and people and nation and makes them to be one. Mm. Now, I don't know about, I'm just, I'm, I'm the outsider speaking, so I don't, I, 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 I'm maybe insensitive to some of the different dynamics that take place in people's viewpoints in, in the family of God at Cole Mill Road. But let me just say that this stuff that's bubbling up in our own time around race and history matters. And it should matter to the people of God because it matters to the heart of God and it matters to this vision of the new creation. It's one of the places that I say, if we're going to reclaim and come out, right, of the old order and not be co-opted and compromised by it, if you're looking for one place in our own time to lean in and say, if nothing else, we may not understand anything else, we will care about this. And we will lay our life on the line as we see um, Jesus lay his life on the line for the sake of this. So. Um, Revelation could point us many other places to interpret our own moment. Um, but at least don't miss that one, <laughs> I would say. Let's not miss that one. Yeah, thanks for that. Is that, is that helpful or direct enough? I can give you another one if you if, want. Uh, <laughs> no, one's enough, <laughs> I think. <laughs> no, we appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to close tonight, Stephen, just praying for you and thanking you for your ministry and uh, as well as praying for us as we continue on this. But thanks again for your time tonight. Hey, thank Let's you so much. Love being with you. Let's pray together as we close. God, we uh, confess that you are a God who is uh, always on the move and renewing creation, uh, even in places that are surprising to us and can be shocking to us. Um, even sometimes when we find ourselves comfortable uh, with life, we know that your newness is always breaking in. So we pray that you give us eyes to see what you're up to and uh, ears to hear what it is that you would say to us, uh, to the church here at Colmill Road in North America and so many other churches, as you are calling us into the new creation that you are birthing through Jesus Christ. God, we thank you so much for Stephen, for his uh, generosity of his time, for his gifts and his talents, and for his ministry, and are appreciative to receive some of that this evening. Uh, be with us all as we seek to be faithful to the way of Jesus in our place, in our time, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. All right. Thank you, Stephen. And hope to connect again soon. Yes, we need to. So. All right. Thanks, everyone.